Yesterday, the Miami Herald came out with an excellent article covering a uh, amended and updated uh, class action lawsuit in the case of Champlain Towers South, the Surfside Collapse. And this lawsuit is made on behalf of the uh, owners and the survivors of the collapse, and they are suing uh, multiple parties as would be anticipated. And so uh, while the article is very, very good and you should read it, I highly recommend that. Um, I know a lot of you guys who watch this channel want uh, deeper dives and, and, and to kind of learn a little bit more. So I went ahead and read the um, read the lawsuit. Uh, it's myself, at least enough to uh, uh, to cover the first party, uh, the first group of parties uh, that I think uh, I want to talk about in this video and that we're going to focus on. But Mainly, the claim centers around four groups or parties that the uh, that they are suing, and and the first one is the developers of um, the neighboring building, eighty seven Park. Um, they claim uh, damaged Champlain Tower South with vibrations and tremors. So I'm going to go into that in this video, and then I'm going to cover the other ones in subsequent videos. Uh, but the other three parties uh, mainly being sued in this lawsuit or being named in this lawsuit as defendants um, is Champlain Tower South itself, the association. So again, this isn't the association suing these people. These are the residents, the owners, and the survivors suing these parties. So they can sue their own association that they belong to. So they're suing the association for failure to fix the building in a timely manner. Uh, they're also suing the engineering firm that was consulting with them from 2018 until the collapse, which was Morabito. Uh, and they are claiming, and I quote, uh, that they failed to, uh, they failed to, and I quote, uh, report adequately the dire situation, end quote. And I'm going to be doing another video um, on that and what that means and, and, and uh, what, they're, what, what they'll need to come up with in order to prove their case. Um, and then the last item, uh, they're actually suing the association's law firm. Um, they're claiming that that law firm failed to quote, uh, I'm sorry, the, the suit is quoted as saying that they ignored red flags, end quote. Um, so the idea being that the, the association's attorneys should have known that, um, that, that additional work needed to be done uh, on the building and that they failed to advise the association to do this work in a timely manner. So that's kind of the idea. But what we're going to talk about in this first one is we're going to talk about the developers and contractors and what their case is against them. So I have several quotes and excerpts here from the uh, lawsuit, the claim, <clears throat> and I'm just going to kind of go through them uh, with you and kind of explain them a bit and hopefully you guys will better understand what's going on in this lawsuit. Uh, first, the developers of 87 Park improperly obtained the right to build higher and larger than originally entitled, including by buying a public street just a few feet from CTS, so CTS is short for Champlain Tower South, uh, just a few feet from CTS's foundation. Then they undertook destructive excavation and site work dangerously close to CTS, sloped their project so that water poured into CTS, and corroded its structural supports and drove sheet piles 40 feet into the ground, causing tremors and vibrations at such high levels that they cracked tiles and walls at CTS and shook the structure. So part of what they're going to have to do, um, they're, they, they're gonna do this in court, but part of what they need to produce now is, is some sort of justification for this claim which which they do provide in their um, in the claim, and which I'm going to go through some of those items, at least the highlights, uh, the ones that I think are their their probably stronger arguments. Um, the first being, which is a little strange, and you'll see why. The first being is that they they they, they point out these four columns um, in the parking garage. Now this graphic is from their. Um, from their lawsuit, so the so the resolution's kind of low, but most of you guys who are have been following are relatively familiar with the, this foundation plan. Um, you know, here is the ramp location, and uh, and then these are the uh, two columns here that you can see in that video excerpt that we've all looked at several times, and I'll show you an image of that in a minute. All right, so the uh, what they're claiming is that they're saying that it's a two part claim. So in order to claim that the developers of 87 uh, uh, Park damaged their building with the vibrations, you, you kind of have to make the argument that your building was sound to begin with, right? 
uh, to an extent. I mean, there's a little bit of a gray area to, to play in there, but for the most part, you got to kind of say, hey, our building was sound before you came and damaged it, right? So that's what the, the first part is here that I highlighted in yellow. It says, these columns were designed configured and built so that not only would each column resist its own allocation of forces exerted by and against the CTS structure, but each would also work in tandem with the overall structural system surrounding it that combined to resist forces exerted by and against the CTS structure. So this is a bunch of legalese that basically says, hey, look at these four columns. These things were designed to hold up the building and they've been holding up the building for 40 years. Um, and, and, and so they were fine to do their job, right? So then the second part of their argument in this paragraph is uh, in green here. It says, tragically, construction at 87 Park irreversibly damaged key structural elements, including the pool deck and support columns. Once these elements failed, the tower was incapable of standing. So they're sort of arguing that I, what it sounds like to me is that the vibration and tremors from the construction at 87 Park um was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back but there's there's some timeline issues here with that right champlain tower south didn't fall until 2021 and you've got um you've got construction ending at at, 80, at uh 87 park i believe in um 2019 if i recall correctly uh we're all very familiar with this vi uh, uh, video still um from prior to the collapse this is again taken from the filing. It's from the claim. This is not my image. This is nothing I've done. I want to show you how the attorneys are presenting their argument. So the attorneys are looking and they're, they've highlighted the two columns that we've all seen in this video. And then they're, they're circling the column. They're claiming column M, um, M11 is missing. That's what they're claiming is missing based on this video. Now, I know uh, Jeff Ostroff on his YouTube channel has you know deep dove into this and he 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 believes that that column is missing from there as well i'm not a, against the idea that the column's missing in this image but i don't feel like there's sufficient evidence video evidence there's a couple reasons for this i really uh dug into this a while back when i was going to do a video uh, and then i decided to scrap the idea but i was looking at where the lights are positioned inside the garage and and what where they cast light onto so there was sufficient light source on this column and this column in my analysis, but given that this ceiling area here had collapsed just beyond um, this column, the light source would also be gone. So there would not necessarily be a light source on the ceiling here to cast light onto this column. So I, again, I'm not saying that the column's there, but it's very difficult based on what I know with the lack of lighting that uh, that we may just not be able to see that column. So uh, I'll just leave that as that. But they in the lawsuit are making the claim that the column is missing. There's that there, that's that's uh, unquestionable as to what they're claiming uh, as far as this image is concerned. And then in this image, they're pointing at M uh, 13 one uh, is saying you know showing that it's still standing. And it's sort of strange because it's like sort of like the argument is, see, look, you know, column uh, M 11.1 is missing. But I mean, it's it's also buried by the building. So I'm not I'm not really sure what, what kind of argument they're trying to make with this imagery. But I wanted to include it to kind of show you a little bit of where their mindset is at. They are definitely claiming that this column M 11.1 is missing. Okay. So the evidence that they produce in this, which is which was more significant than I expected uh, before I saw this lawsuit and read through it. So I want to kind of go through this. Um, one of the key players that I'm going to mention that you ought to know is NV5. NV5 is the um, geotechnical engineering firm that was uh, on the project for 87 Park. And they were the ones advising and, and uh, the uh, developer and the contractor uh, for the construction of that building. Now, in uh, one of their early documents, they state uh, this, which is that the vibrations produced by the operation of the compactor should be monitored for potential adverse effect on adjacent existing structures, pavements, and utilities. If nearby structures will be affected by the vibration of the compactor, the compaction procedure may require modification as approved by NV5. 
So this is sort of obviously pre-construction and they're warning that, hey, you know, the system that you chose is, is, going to is going to cause vibrations and these vibrations need to be monitored to see if they adversely affect neighboring buildings. Now, the interesting thing was, was that NV5 actually gave the developer several different options of foundations that they could pick for this building. And uh, one of the options is called a sheet pile system. All right, and for each of these options, NV5 gave advantages and disadvantages. So what they're trying to do, they're trying to do what a good engineering firm would normally do, and they're, they're trying to educate the consumer, which is their client, the developer, on all of the facts of the case, and then let them choose what they want to do. Uh, in this case, the, the, uh, they list some of the disadvantages of the sheet pile system as being uh, sheets installed by vibratory driving can cause damaging vibrations to adjacent properties and structures. So this goes back kind of to that previous statement. That previous statement was written after the developer had already picked the sheet pile system. Now the argument in the lawsuit is, is that the reason why the developer picked the sheet pile system, despite the disadvantage that it could damage nearby buildings, was that it was the cheapest option. Now I'm not saying it's the cheapest option, I'm just saying that's what the lawsuit alleges uh, is the reason why they chose this system. It's, it's fast, people are also familiar with it, but it is the cheaper of all the options that NV5 gave them. Now, in order to monitor the adjacent properties, uh, a, a company called Geosonics uh, was, was retained uh, to install monitors. So they installed two of these devices that you can see here in this image. They installed two of them along the wall of Champlain Tower South. So along the south wall, right adjacent to the pool deck. And instead of doing, uh, one of the other things that the lawsuit alleges is that they could have done continuous monitoring of the vibrations. Uh, the device is capable of doing that, but instead of doing that, they decided to do um, intermittent testing on various days. And of course, you know, cost would be a controlling factor for why they did this. So they did testing on March 3rd, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and the 14th of the year 2016. So they would come out, they would presumably hook up to the device or, or read the take the readings of the device for those days while the sheet piles are being driven and vibrated into place to monitor the vibrations at the building. Now, here's where it starts getting interesting. All right, so NV5, which again is that geotechnical engineering firm for 87 Park, uh, they explained in its March 28th, 2016 uh, summary report that although vibration limits were never formally established for the 87 Park project, industry standards dictated that vibrations of half of an inch per second, so this is going to be a key thing to remember here, half an inch per second can cause property damage. Okay, so then you, if you recall, they did that testing on all those days, there was a numerous amount of days, and then each day they took you know, periodic tests. Well, they ended up taking 36 vibration readings over that over all those days. And based on their own reports, what the lawsuit is 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 pointing out um, is that they found 29 out of the 36 uh, vibration readings exceeded the allowable threshold of a half inch per second. And I didn't. Uh, I'm not going to include all them because really the resolution was kind of low and it's hard to see um, uh, on a YouTube video, but. Um, a lot of the readings that I found were three quarters of an inch or more. So this wasn't like they just kind of barely exceeded half of an inch per second. They 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 grossly exceeded, you know, 20 or 25 percent um, these readings. So this is all part of the documentary evidence for the case. They have all of these tests. They have all these results. They have all these emails between the parties saying that vibrations are going on and things like that. One of the key telling things though, is that they actually have emails from the residents to the developer of 87. So the residents of Central of, of uh, Champlain Towers South emailing the developer and contractors about the vibrations. And I wanna kind of read to you, this is out, again, out of the lawsuit filing, one of those uh, email breakdowns. So on March 17th, 2016, now if you remember those dates from before, this is right in the mix of when all of the vibration and compact or vibration uh, installation of the sheet piles uh, uh, was being done. Um, a family wrote 
an email to one of the Terra defendants project managers. So Terra, again, is the company behind, they are the developer behind 87 Park, okay? Um, and so they wrote that they were very concerned because of the daily tremors that they encountered, right? Uh, in our, and they encountered this, they say, in our apartments, sitting, standing, laying in bed. So in other words, they're trying to convey that it doesn't matter where they're standing. It's not like they're just out on the balcony and they can feel the vibrations. They're saying it's everywhere in their ha in their unit they can feel these vibrations. And they go on to say, standing on our balcony, we found a crack on the wall near our balcony. And then they say, and I think the English is just a little rough here, so I'll try to smooth it out as best I can. But the way I understand this next sentence is it says, it is not fair that you, Terra Group, are doing your job while our building is getting damaged and our residents' lives are being put into danger uh, uh, and, and possibly have our apartment's walls demolished. So, you know, again, this is sort of like what they're saying is, is, you know, you're going and building this building, everything's hunky-dory for you, but over here at Champlain Tower South, we're seeing cracks appear, we're dealing with vibrations, and our building's falling apart. Um, and then they close their email by saying, you know, we write this message to inform you of what our residents encounter daily because you must be aware of what happens with your workers in heavy machinery, and you must be concerned of what happens to us, the residents in our building, Champlain Tower South. So there's several other um, excerpts and examples in this lawsuit showing that the residents did feel the vibrations from the installation of the sheet piles of 87 Park, and that they claim to have seen physical damage occur to their building because of this. Part of the problem is go, going to be in this lawsuit and part of the, de the, the the defense, I think, that the developer will take is, yes, we got these emails from you, right? I mean, there's no denying that these emails were sent, but if your building was really so severely damaged by us it, during in 2016, right? Remember your dates. Why didn't your engineer, when he came out in 2018, mention any of this in his report that it was damaged due to vibrations or due to our work. So they're going to have a pretty positive you know, defense in that case where they're gonna say, and not only are you claiming that we damaged your building in 2016, but your building didn't collapse until 2021 and you did nothing between 2016 and 2021. You didn't sue us for, for, for vibration damages or anything like that. So this is gonna be part of that, that, that back and forth that you're gonna see between these parties on this particular aspect of the case. Last thing I want to do is show you the other uh, a little bit of what this uh, lawsuit claims against the other three parties, because those are going to end up being parts of the next uh, videos in, in this series. Uh, and so uh, in, in the lawsuit, it states, meanwhile, when it came time for CTS to undergo repairs in connection with its building recertification, the Champlain Tower South Condominium Association failed to fulfill its responsibility to timely levy the necessary assessment and carry out the needed repairs. So I remember when I opened up this video, I said the first person they're suing is the developers and contractors. The second person they're suing, which is based on this sentence here, is the association itself, Champlain Tower South, the association. The third party that they are suing is the engineer. So the uh, in this in this case would be Morabito and Associates. So and they state that, and I quote, the engineer hired by the association to investigate the structure failed to report adequately on the dire situation. So there's a lot to unpackage there, and I'm going to do that in a future video. The fourth uh, entity that they're suing, which I was actually a little bit surprised about. Um, I don't know why, but usually in lawsuits, it's like a shotgun approach. You try to sue everybody, right? But um, the last one, and, and I'll, I'll read it right from the lawsuit. It says, and the experienced law firm hired to represent the association on whom the board of directors relied for advice and counsel ignored red flags indifferent to the obvious danger facing residents. Now, I haven't gotten far enough into this 169 page document to see what is the documentary evidence that the law firm ignored blatant red flags and failed to inform or, or instruct or advise their client to do these repairs in a more timely fashion. But that will be interesting too. If I find anything really fascinating there, I'll definitely make sure I do another video on that. In closing, they state that the collapse was entirely preventable. I think that is, I mean, I mean, the reality is, is like, sure. I mean, the building could have been built correctly. 
the building could have been maintained in a timely fashion. There's also the building could have not undergone vibrations. There's all sorts of contributing factors. Remember, from day one, I've always used the term contributing factors. And the reason why is because when it comes down to these lawsuits, you notice they didn't just sue one entity for knocking down their building or for causing the building to collapse. They're suing multiple entities for multiple things. And these are all contributing factors. And so what's going to happen is they're going to have to figure out and assign damages. Okay, well, 20% of the lawsuit should be paid by you. 50% of the lawsuit should be paid by you and so on. But they're, but they're claiming is that it was entirely preventable. I mean, the, the reality is yes, everything, every collapse is, is preventable. Um, but the point really here is what evidence do they have that some person or some entity along the road could have themselves prevented it and didn't? That's going to be the key question for this case. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I look forward to going through this uh, uh, claim, this lawsuit further and producing some more videos on the other subjects that are being sued. Let me know what you think in the comments section. Thanks.